Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So it's good to be here. So, we're, so this is a place where Dickens was a fellow, where Karl Marx was a fellow, and I'm here to talk about sales. <laughs> Two ideas on sales, all right? The first idea is this. Like it or not, we're all in sales now. Let me unpack what I mean by that. If you look at the UK workforce, about one in 10 people in the UK workforce are in sales. That is, their job is to get people to buy stuff. They're selling computer equipment. They're selling uh, automobiles, they're selling consulting services. One in 10 people in the UK workforce, their job is to sell stuff. But something even more important going on, if you look at those people in the gray area, they're in sales too. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I did a really interesting, pretty exhaustive survey. Happened to be of the American workforce. 7,000 adult full-time workers in the United States. And one of the questions we asked people was this. What percentage of your work involves convincing or persuading people to give up something they value, attention, effort, et cetera, for something that you can offer. So think about that for a second. Think about it in your own work for a moment. What percentage of your time do you, at work do you spend convincing or persuading people to give up something they value for something you can offer? Now, this is kinda, sorta like sales, right? It's an exchange. You give me this, I give you that, and theoretically we're both better off. It's kind of, sort of, like sales. So think about it in your own work, what percentage of your own time. Think about that for a moment. And here's what we got from 7,000 adult full-time workers. And again, the composition of the US workforce and the UK workforce is actually rather similar. Here's what we got. People reporting spending an average of 41% of their time in this thing that's kind of, sort of, like sales. That's a lot of time, all right? That's 24 minutes of every hour, of every day, of every week. 24 minutes of every hour in something that I like to call non-sales selling. It's selling, but the cash register's not ringing. It's selling, but no money's changing hands. It's selling, but the, it's, the transaction isn't denominated in dollars or pounds or euros. It's denominated in attention or effort or energy or zeal or commitment. These are people who are pitching their ideas at meetings. These are people going to their boss saying, can I have some more resources to do this project? These are people going to their teammates and saying, come and work on my project, not this other bad project over there. Um, over and over and over again, 40% of their time on non-sales selling. You got in this workforce, one in 10 people in sales sales and nine in 10 in non-sales selling. Like it or not, we're all in sales now. I wanna pick up on the first four words there like it or not, because you know what? Most of you don't like that. Do sales have a, con a positive connotation or a negative connotation? Ne this is the interactive part of the presentation. <laughs> negative, right? How negative? Very. Very negative. Let's get at that, OK? But let's get at that. In, let's not go with our hunches. Let's get at that in a systematic way. So we go back out into the field and ask people this question. When you think of sales or selling, what's the first word? that comes to mind. Pushy is your first word. OK, who else has a word? Money. Money. Aggressive. Aggressive. Insincere. insincere. No. Dirty. All right, this is good. This is, these are nice words, right? Pushy, insincere, dirty. Here are the top 25 adjectives that people offered. The number one word, which actually was the number one word in this audience, pushy, number one word overall. Fake, slimy, sleazy, smarmy, manipulative, dishonest. This is a very widely held view of sales, and I'm convinced it's a relic. It's entirely wrong. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Most of what we know about sales comes from a world where sellers had a huge amount more information than buyers. When sellers have a huge amount more information than buyers, the seller can rip you off. The seller can rip you off. When sellers have a lot of more information than buyers, when buyers don't have many choices, when buyers don't have a way to talk back, the seller can really rip you off. Buyer beware. Buyer beware is a principle of information asymmetry. When buyers don't have much information, when they don't have a lot of choices, when they have no way to talk back, and the seller has a huge information advantage, that's a world of buyer beware. But that's not the world we live in now. Go buy a car today. You can go in there and know what other 
car sellers are selling the car for. You can go in there, you can go to an online user group of Ford Focus owners who talk about their Ford Focuses all the time. <laughs> and you can find out all the idiosyncrasies about that model and go into the dealer and say, listen, here are some of the idiosyncrasies. They gotta give me a little bit of a better price. We've gone from a world where buyers have limited information, not many choices, and no way to talk back, to a world where buyers have lots of information, arguably as much as sellers, lots of choices, and all kinds of ways to talk back. That's a very different world. That's a world of seller beware, where now the sellers are on notice. And this difference between buyer beware and seller beware is not a difference in degree. It is a difference in kind. It is a different enterprise. Selling in a world of seller beware is different in kind than selling in a world of buyer beware. So the question is, and the question that I wanted to look at, is this is right, if these two ideas are right, or that they're more right than wrong? One, like it or not, we're all in sales now. Two, sales isn't what it used to be. How the heck do you get better at this? And to answer that question, I went to the social science. It turns out there are very few scholars studying sales per se, but there are a lot of behavioral scientists studying a whole wide array of economic transactions, of uh, social psychology that helps us understand persuasion and communication and processing of messages and so forth. So I went to this research and tried to identify what are the qualities that allow us to do this well and ethically in a world of seller beware. And I identified three qualities. I identified three qualities. These are the foundational qualities of being effective in persuading, influencing, convincing, moving people in a world of seller beware. They are the new ABCs, attunement, perspective taking. Can you attune yourself to someone else, understand their perspective? This is really, really powerful and essential. Again, in sales, if you're trying to sell computer equipment, but if you're trying to convince an employee to do something a different way, if you're trying to convince your boss to do, give you a different assignment, if you're trying to convince your kids to clean up their room. Buoyancy. I talked to a salesman had a lovely way of putting this. He said that the hardest part about being in sales, he's been selling door to door, he's been selling brushes door to door in America for 40 years. He said the hardest part about being in sales is this, every day you face, and this is his really poetic phrase, an ocean of rejection. And buoyancy is how do you remain afloat on that ocean of rejection? If we're all in sales now, we're gonna get rejected a lot. So how do you remain buoyant in that ocean of rejection? Social science gives us some clues. What do you do before an encounter? It turns out that questioning your abilities is often more effective than pumping yourself up. What do you do during an encounter? It actually, much to my dismay, showed that positivity actually works. Positivity has some virtues within limits, within limits, some very, very interesting limits. Finally, clarity. We live in a world of washing information. Having access to information doesn't give you any kind of comparative advantage. What gives you any kind of comparative advantage is being able to curate that information, distill that information, make sense of that information, take that information and say all of this is noise, but this part is signal. The other thing about clarity, we tend to give too much credit to problem solving as a skill. Here's the thing, if you're in sales sales and your customer or your prospect knows precisely what its problem is, they can probably find the solution without you. You're not that valuable. Where are you valuable? When they don't know what their problem is or they're wrong about their problem. So the premium in some very, very interesting ways has shifted from problem solving as a skill to problem finding. Can you identify problems people don't realize that they have? Can you surface latent problems? Can you look down the road one beat, two beats, three beats and say, you're not facing this problem now, but this is a problem you're going to confront and you better be prepared for it. So that's attunement, buoyancy, and clarity. And the social science on this is absolutely fascinating and yields some very, very important lessons. So let me talk a few minutes about attunement. I want to give you some rules of attunement that I think that will allow you to understand this conceptually, but also give you some tactics to put them into use. There's a technique that social psychologists use to measure perspective taking. It's a technique since the 1980s. And what they do is they bring, and I'm gonna demonstrate it for you right here. Identify your dominant hand. I'm right-handed, okay? I've identified my dominant hand. Now, with your dominant hand, take a skin-safe erasable marker, and on your forehead, 
draw a capital E. Now, there are two different ways to do this. I'm going to demonstrate this for you right now. <laughs> All right, the two different ways to do this. I can draw the E like this, or I can draw the E like this. What's the difference? Who's looking at the E? If I drew it like this, I'm taking my perspective. If I drew it like this, I'm taking your perspective. In a particular moment, what is the default? What's your default move? Do you take someone else's perspective or do you take your own perspective? And most people actually draw the E like this. Most people end up, their default is to take the other's perspective. But it turns out, which I'll explain to you in a few moments, is ends up being very manipulable. It ends up being very subject to context. And if you're aware of the context you're in, you can get better at taking, drawing the E this way rather than that way. There's an inverse relationship between power and perspective taking. The more power someone has, the more power someone feels, the more likely they are to do the E like this. In experimental settings, if you just give people a small dose of power, make them feel powerful by having them recite their accomplishments or sort of affirming their positions that they've been in power or times they've had influence over other people, it's a remarkable what happens, that when you just prime people with a little bit of power, they become three times as likely to draw the E this way rather than that way. It's amazing. It's really quite amazing. Why is that? Because power leads people to anchor too heavily in their own vantage point, insufficiently adjusting to others' perspectives. So here's the lesson this yields. It's really important. If you look at status, high status people stink at perspective taking in general. Low status people, very good perspective takers which makes sense because they're not in charge. So what's the lesson for you? Increase your power by reducing it. I'm Mary's boss, all right? And I want Mary to do something different. I want Mary to do something in a different way. If I'm the boss, I can say, Mary, here's what you're doing. Do it this way. I can basically command her to do that. And Mary might do that. I'm her boss. She needs a job. She might go do that. She'll likely do it grudgingly. But I'm going to be more effective in getting Mary to do something different or do something in a different way if I go to Mary and I consciously think, you know what? Maybe our organization needs Mary a lot more than Mary needs us. Maybe even if I'm nominally her boss, I actually need her a lot, and she's actually really important for me getting my objectives done. I sort of consciously lower my power a little bit. I become more acute at taking her perspective. If I'm more acute at taking her perspective, I begin to surface reasons why Mary might want to do this. I start seeing what's in it for Mary, and that allows us to reach common ground. Let me go to another one. Very simple experiment yields a very important lesson. The experimenters put people into a negotiation setting. Put people into a negotiation setting. Three different groups of people. One group goes into the negotiation setting. They're our control group. Second group goes into the negotiation setting, and they're given some instructions. They say, imagine what the other side is thinking. This second group, focus on what th the other side is thinking. Focus on their interests. Third group, same set of facts, same preparation. But they're told, focus on what the other side is feeling. Focus on their emotions. Not surprisingly, the feelers and the thinkers both did better than the control group. But what's your prediction? Who did better, the feelers or the thinkers? OK, how many people think feelers? How many people think thinkers? You know what? We want the feelers to do better, don't we? <laughs> But it was the thinkers. The thinkers did better. This is an important lesson. Because when we think about perspective taking, it sounds superficially like kind of a quote unquote soft skill. But it actually has a hard edge to it. It's a little bit different from empathy. It's a little bit different from emotional intelligence. It ends up being very muscular, very analytical. What's the, so if you get, focusing on the other side's feelings is always effective. It's another channel of information. But the second lesson here is to use your head as much as your heart. Don't think of perspective taking only as empathizing with someone or understanding their feelings. Think of it as what's their interest? What are they thinking? It ends up being a very hard-headed skill. Let's talk about what kind of people do best in this realm. What kind of people do best in this realm? It's pretty clear, right? Extroverts are better salespeople than introverts. Here's what the facts say. Very clear here. Extroverts are more likely to go into sales jobs. Extroverts are more likely to get hired in sales jobs. Extroverts are more likely to get promoted in sales jobs. Very clear findings there. The only wrinkle in this theory is that when you look at the link between extroversion and sales performance, not who gets hired, not who gets promoted, but who sells stuff, the correlation between extroversion and sales performance is practically zero. So does this mean that 
introverts are better salespeople than extroverts? Let's find out. Interesting research from Adam Grant. Here's what he did. He went to a software company. They had a big sales force. And he measured the introversion, extroversion levels of this sales force. Then they went out for three months, and he measured how much they actually sold. All right? We're, not talk we're looking at performance here. We're not looking at who, who can cozy up to a boss. We're looking at performance. It turns out that the extroverts did a little bit better. But neither group did nearly as well as a third group, the ambiverts, which raises a question. Ambiverts? <laughs> this is a term that's been around since the 1920s. It describes people who are a little bit extroverted, a little bit introverted. They're not strongly one way or another. They're kind of in the middle. These people did really well. There's a really interesting chart where Adam Grant plotted people's introversion, extroversion scores against gross revenue. It's a one to seven scale. One is extremely introverted. Seven is extremely extroverted. Not surprisingly, the strong introverts, they are not very good salespeople. Don't like to strike up conversations. Don't like to assert. They're not very good at it. But these strong extroverts, they're not much better. These are the people we think are the naturals. These are the people who get hired. These are the people we think are awesome at it, you know? The glad-handing, smiley, back-slapping, hey, buddy, what can I do to put you in a Ford Fiesta today kind of guys. They're not very good at it. They're barely better than these people on the other end of the spectrum. They're hiding in a corner afraid to pick up the phone. What's going on here? They're too pushy. They don't listen. They come on too strong. Who does the best? The people in the middle. They know when to speak up. They know when to shut up. They know when to push. They know when to hold back. They know when to inspect. They know when to respond. They are ambidextrous in a way. They can move to their left. They can move to their right. These people, by far, are the best salespeople. But here's one thing that I want to leave you with, which is this. If you look at the, in, the distribution of introversion and extroversion in the population, it looks pretty much like this. Some of us are very strong introverts. Some of us are very strong extroverts. But most of us, the vast majority of us, are kind of in the middle. We're a little bit of both, which should be good news for all of us. So the third lesson of attunement is this. When you think about moving people, persuading people, influencing people, don't think that you need to be like a certain kind of person. Third lesson is just be more like yourself, because selling is human. Thanks for your time.